We've been going at this a while. We had a good night last night. We've had a very good day today. Several people who have been to a number of these have walked up to me and said, this is the best group. This group has been the most diverse, the most interesting, the most engaged, the most committed to their roles. I think that's true. I think it's been a really good day. But none of these processes are actually better than their conclusions. Um, none of them are better than, you know, what are the big ideas? Are there new ideas? Are we coming up with something new and fresh in the context of this discussion? And so for this session, we'll leave the roles behind. We want to be ourselves. We want each of you to be leading experts in this area, just as you are all leading experts. And because we've done this before and we felt that it was always very important to bring in some outside perspectives, we're very fortunate to have here with us Greg Treverton, who's the chairman of the National Intelligence Council, which is a really important part of the director of national intelligence that looks forward. And Greg is a leading thinker on intelligence and on how intelligence can be used uh, and how it should evolve uh, to face the challenges of the world that we uh, are living in and likely to live in in the future. And then. Um, at the end of the table here is uh, Graham Allison, who is well known to all of you from Harvard's Kennedy School, one of the leading thinkers on foreign policy for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, and he asserts this was his grandfather, but in, fa in fact, up in our office at foreign policy is copy number one of foreign policy, which came out in the winter of 7071. And one of the most important articles in it was by Graham Allison. And so every event we do, we bring him. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but, but, but Graham has been part of this dialogue for a long time and is one of the smartest strategic thinkers uh, that we know. Uh, and so here's how this is going to work. Uh, Nancy's going to offer some them thematic conclusions from the day. I'll fill in one or two if I've got any. And then I'm going to pose a question to Greg and pose a question to Graham about how this might fit into the longer term way we manage these kind of issues pertaining to violent extremism. I mean, our focus here is combating violent extremism. So what are, what are some longer term ideas about it? And then after literally just one round of this, what I want to do is open it up to the audience so that you've got some of your best ideas. If you have no ideas, don't say anything. <laughs> That's my suggestion. You know, but if you've got a, an idea, a suggestion on the policy front, offer that up. And then periodically I will turn to this group and say, well, what's your reaction to that? And we will try to make the next 45 minutes lively and fast paced. You know what that means. So, Nancy. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to offer a few thematics that uh, really emerged from the day. And the first is that. You know, the, uh, this, is, this is definitely a problem that relates to the highly interconnected world that we live in, not just from the issues around recruiting that we discussed, but also the way knowledge spreads. And so policies that are practiced, these, these kinds of approaches affect how um, extremism is understood in, in any given uh, locale. So the, the interconnected, interrelated nature of the world makes it very difficult. And the second piece of that is it also limits the ability of states to be principal movers of solutions. And that emerged very strongly in terms of uh, what we experienced this morning where we really weren't able to use uh, the usual state levers to come up with different solutions or effective solutions and the importance of the private sector, the civil society, of faith leaders and of understanding uh, what exactly is, is uh, motivating and moving millennials. So that leads to one of the conclusions that emerged um, both with Tom Donilon and Steve Hadley and in various comments and the importance of really considering in, uh, more integrated strategies, that we need to have a number of these voices at the table in order to understand how the relationship of what we do matters both in the short term and the long term and from the hard side and the soft side. And I liked very much Jorn's comments that sometimes the soft side is the hard side because it's more difficult to really understand what will work or what won't work, especially with longer term time horizons and sometimes political pressures. Um, which is the next point, and that is 
there is still a very weak evidence basis for understanding what some of these interactions and what some of these um, interventions will actually do and what they will do in a particular context. Um, finally is the uh, importance of a local focus, that we spent the morning talking about some of these larger frames, a um, uh, lot of it happening more at the UN and state level. When we got down to particular places and more specific pieces of the problem, we started coming up with more specific possible solutions that looked at uh, the role of local police, the role of communities, the role of understanding um, what is uh, moving a particular uh, young person into or out of extremism and thinking a bit more granularly about how to address that in a particular community, looking at um, what Tom called the conducive conditions that can and must be addressed locally. There was a very important discussion, Georgia and a couple others mentioned this, about uh, Steve Hadley also, about not just the counter narrative, uh, but also understanding what is the positive vision, what is the alternative identity, and how do you understand that, and how do you support it, and who articulates it, and how do you support that. Um, finally, I think we just need to note the very forward and often audacious proposals by our tech industry colleagues, um, and it underscores that tech is uh, clearly an actor uh, both in how some of the um, particulars of this uh, issue that we're discussing today are spread and, and th if we can harness some of that creative energy for solutions, um, that gives us a, a pathway to keep focused on into the future. So those are a few thematics. Over okay, to thank, you. thank you. Let me, let me offer a couple of others that, uh, that, that I picked up in the way. Uh, and this, you know, I, I'm gonna turn to Greg and then I'm gonna turn to Graham and sort of say, based on what you've just heard and based on what you know, you know, what kind of priorities would you set in terms of dealing with these issues? Uh, I, I, I was struck at the beginning by, you know, the, the discussion that Catherine kicked off of sort of five W's and an H. You know, this is the who, what, where, when, why, you know, and how we go and tackle it. And one of the reasons I am is because there is clearly a spectrum of responses here you know, from dealing with this from the supply side to the demand side, dealing with this from um, identifying the people who are most likely to end up uh, being drawn to violent extremism and dealing with, you know, trying to create off ramps so that they don't go there, uh, to interdicting them as they are on the way there, uh, to uh, getting them off that path after they have been there. Uh, and that each of these things involves a whole range of tools. Uh, and I noticed as I was looking at the Twitter that somebody said that I denigrated uh, soft solutions and soft power and sort of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the psychotherapeutic uh, side of this thing. That's wrong. That's, I do not, uh, I feel those things are vitally important to all of this. And what I think I was trying to say was that, you know, uh, you know uh, Nancy mentioned the, 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 that sometimes doing what's soft is hard, but you know, we talked about going from the social to the science, from, from the interpretive, qualitative, to the quantitative, uh, from dealing with the social origins of this to dealing with the battlefield consequences of this. And there are no solutions that deal with just one element of it or another, and that there are some elements of this that are more distasteful than other elements of this. Um, uh, and that we, you know, can't do all of it. And so we have to prioritize. And so another key point that was made in a number of cases, Shlomo made the point and others made the point, is we have to identify, we can't you know, stop the flow of violent extremists everywhere. We have to identify choke points. We sort of have to look at the cardiovascular system of violent extremism and identify the, the, the points where we can place pressure and reduce the effectiveness of the system at the beginning, along the way, um, and at the end. As we do so, another of the points that came up is that we have to be very careful of unintended consequences. So, you know, if we act, we must act proportionally. Um, because to me, if there is one, you know, big takeaway from this, it's, and this goes back to the soft-hard dichotomy, it's that narrative 
is action, and action is narrative. You cannot say we are going to create a counter-narrative and behave in a way that undermines your counter-narrative. You have to behave in a way that actually supports and embodies your narrative, because words alone won't do the trick. Um, and if you give one area which, you know, if you take one action, it's going to be seized upon by an adversary and used. And so this, this narrative equals action thing is extremely important. I too, like Nancy, was struck by um, the need to m gather more evidence and move more towards the use of big data as we can in finding these kind of solutions. Identifying the individual movements at the local level, quantifying them, translating that information in real time to actors who can take advantage of it, identifying trends very early rather than requiring them to accumulate over time so that things can be nipped in the bud, uh, and also using that kind of data analysis to actually understand what is driving uh, actions. Um, which gets us to, you know, one other question which we haven't gotten into here, um, uh, but I think we ought to over some time, and that is, what about count, uh, uh, countering violent extremism is unique to the 21st century environment? There have always been violent extremists. There has always been terrorism. There have always been violent outbursts against governments um, uh, and individuals who were unpopular. Um, but do we live in an era in which the ability to connect small alienated groups into larger groups change the character of threats going forward? The ability to respond quickly to information, for there to be a very rapid spread of a viewpoint, for a narrative to take life and go viral changes the nature and the character of threats? You know, do we live in a point where today we're talking about violent extremism um, uh, as it's manifested in the political problems of the Middle East, but we could just as easily face these kinds of issues, this metastasization of social dysfunction in domestic problems in the United States or in Europe or in Russia or in other places that will mimic many of these things because we are living with a new kind of social construct that is, that is empowered by new technologies. I'm not sure, but I think we need to think about that. And I think we, we, we run a risk if we look at the problem in terms of the proximate threat, whether it was core Al-Qaeda, or it's Daesh today, or it's militant Islamic threats across the world, or it's something else. I, I, I think too narrow a view is is problematic. Um, so with that in mind, you've heard now from Nancy and I sort of where this is. Um, you're clearly at a disadvantage of not of having heard the whole day, but, but perhaps there are two or three things that resonate with your view on how to deal with these things that we can turn to, Greg and then Graham. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the, uh, the session. I just got back from Asia late last night, so I had to put in an appearance at the office at least. Uh, let me just say a couple things and then hope others will react. I'll pick up David's last one. I think this is, we are seeing in technology and other ways, a, a new, this is different. That the combination of people being able to live in their own echo chamber, to communicate quickly, uh, does mean to self-radicalize themselves on the net. That's, that's, I think, quite different. And that does seem to me to be a, a characteristic of, a, of the future we, we face. It's obviously very difficult for folks like me who work in intelligence, because that means individual groups may be atomized and therefore hard to find, radicalize quickly, and sometimes act fairly quickly after they radicalize. Though we do know that the vast majority of people that radicalize then don't go on to commit violence. And maybe there is in that atomization some advantage in the sense that the kind of semi-lone wolves, very hard to predict, attacks we've seen are almost certain to continue, but happily they have been, while well, well, tragic, less damaging than the major attacks we've feared since 9-11. So there is by that, that atomization I think makes for, both for less capability on their part, but still lethal, 
uh, and maybe the silver lining is it makes uh, uh, less harm to us when an attack happens. Though politically, as you know, it's very hard to say that out loud. The other point I guess I would make strongly is, to, this is Nancy's point, that this really is a difficult area for governments to act. Now, almost anything we did to try and create a counter narrative would be suspect, suspect from the get go. Uh, as she says, we also then have to act primarily through intergovernmental organizations. What we, uh, uh, where I said in the intelligence world, try to do, and this is all difficult enough, is to remind our colleagues that uh, other people view the world very differently than we do. Uh, and not everybody, it turns out, really aspires to be a middle-class American. They're moved by many other things as well. And by the way, by their own testimony, many of the would-be terrorists, almost all of the would-be terrorists, mention U.S. and other Western policies as part of why they radicalized. So that's a tough message to get across, but it does mean, it seems to me, that the uh, the counter-counter-narrative needs to be done by communities, all the emphases you've had, can't be done across a region, different, it's a local set of issues, very hard for, as we know, often when we talk to the parents of radicalized people, they say, gosh, I had no idea. So even communities can fail, but it's got to be there that the, that the task is most impressive. And even for the government to help communities is difficult, because the last thing we want to do is uh, kill someone by our embrace. So I think this does have to be primarily the work of the private sector, of police, local police, local communities, local NGOs. Um, I think that seems to be a, a strong conclusion. It makes it hard to implement uh, because that means the implementation is atomized as well, but I think it's the powerful insight. Let me stop there, David. Now, you know, that's a really, really important point, and I, th I, you know, I think it's a kind of a, a, a key takeaway here which hasn't come up. And I would characterize it as mirroring. Just as a group like Daesh can grow decentralized, open source, across many borders, take many forms, um, embrace lots of local issues, and use them to their benefit, people alienated for lots of reasons, that the response also has to be decentralized, localized, uh, open source, using the tools that are available, um, not top down, um, not one size fits all. Uh, and that that requires, you know, that's sort of how companies think today. Um, it's, and, 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 and it's not how governments think. They tend to say, well, let's get a bunch of governments together, we'll hand down a set of rules, and, and they will be implemented. Uh, and I think we need to um, think a little bit about how that mirroring can be used as a, as a, as a, as a, as a tool. Um, Graham. So thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry that I've missed uh, most of the conversation, but uh, I've had a, several pairs of eyes and ears here, uh, and uh, they've given me some benefit of their takeaways. I make two big points. First, uh, uh, an academic moment, okay? So I'll go back to 1793. Uh, that's back a long time ago. Uh, 1793, just to remind you, the 1776 was the Declaration of Independence. 83, the war was with Britain was over. Uh, 89, the Constitution. Uh, 1789 was also a big event in France, uh, the Revolution. So 1793, two big things happened, at least in the European American space. Uh, in the European space, you got to the reign of terror. So the guillotine at the Place de Concorde started chopping people, 3,000 that year in, in Paris, and 30,000 across the rest of France. But in Philadelphia, which was then the capital of the U.S., uh, people started dying from what was called yellow fever. And yellow fever was an identified uh, illness. People caught it. They turned a little yellowish, many of them, and uh, a large number of them died. So over the course of the summer of 1793, uh, more than 10% of the population of Philadelphia died. Uh, John Adams was the vice president, 
Abigail Adams, his wife, a very uh, thoughtful, outspoken person who knew many, many things, explained to her sister what was going on in Philadelphia in the summer of 1793. She said, in the summer it became hotter, the rivers became uh, 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 turmoil, there was more, more uh, uh, turmoil in the river. This gave off putrid air, and the putrid air caused the disease. So she said to John, let's get the hell out of there. And they left and were gone for five months, the vice president. He went back to Braintree, Massachusetts. And in the fall, at the end of November, when it became colder, the putrid air went away, and they returned, the vice president, to the Capitol. Now, why might that be relevant for this conversation? I'm wondering. Okay. <laughs> I would say the conversation that's been held about this in Washington, in general in the policy community, is way, way, way more like the conversation in 1793 about whatever was happening than most people are prepared to recognize. That is, if you think about something you said earlier in one of the sessions, David, about the viral uh, uh, analogy. Okay? So actually think about uh, this if you were a medical person. Just think of it from the medical perspective. So medicine has actually progressed since 1793. Many other areas of policy I'm less comfortable or confident about, and certainly in this space. But in any case, medicine asks four questions. First, what the cause? Is this a virus or is it a bacteria? Do we know the genetic code? In the case of whatever we call it, violent extremism or whatever, does we have a good sense of the cause? I don't think so, okay? Secondly, uh, how is it transmitted? So in the case of uh, Ebola, to take an analogy that we've thought about lately, unless there's a transfer of bodily fluid from one to the other, there's no transfer. In the case of yellow fever, it takes a mosquito, not just a mosquito, a female mosquito, who bites one, gets the fluid, transmits to another. In the case of uh, ISIS or Daesh or violent extremism, well, let me count the ways. I'm not sure we understand. Next, who's susceptible? So in the case of Ebola, you look at populations. At the, at, in the case of, of, uh, of violent extremism, here I think there's a little bit of help. So these are mostly males. They're mostly testosterone-driven. They're mostly 16 or 18 to 35. They top out. Okay. There's a few females, and there's a few others. But if for whatever reason, the population of males from 16 to 35 went into a deep freeze for that period, would this problem be different? It might be, so just to be controversial. Finally, do we know what to do about it? So in the case of uh, yellow fever, the answer was to purge people. So you gave them a mercurial purge, and they vomited, and this was thought to make them better or you bled them, <clears throat> that let down their blood pressure. I would say many of the treatments we're administering look, look about as good. So I would, my, my takeaway from the analogy is to simply say, I think about this phenomena, we can talk, we can use a lot of categories, we can make some analogies, but I think it's about as well understood as yellow fever in 1793. I think it's a great analogy from Dr. Allison. Um, it also calls to mind, by the way, a discussion that I had not too long ago with a group of people in Washington addressing cyber threats and new technological threats. And people were going around the room, and the military people were coming up with a military response, we need a cyber command. And the intelligence people were coming up with an intelligence response, we need to gather information from the internet and deal with that. And, you know, in this particular case, we have economic people saying the solution is jobs and political people saying the solution is a political solution. And there you start thinking, gee, um, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, you start thinking people sort of stay in their lanes. But during that discussion, just to take your metaphor in a direction I don't think you 
thought it was going to go. A guy came up um, uh, who happened to be the head of one of the advanced research projects agencies that we have in the U.S. government, whose training was as a public health first official. And he said, maybe the way to deal with cyber, and it, and it just echoes with this discussion, is actually the public health model. I mean, and, and, and I think it, it may pertain to this at the origin stage. The public health model says, ask the questions that Graham asked, and then try to come up with some best practices and some education and the kind of things that reduce the likelihood of the contagion that reduce, you know, that make people aware of the potential threats, um, uh, that involve a sharing of information as more is known, and that helps to contain the threat. Now, I'm, there is no one-size-fits-all threat. We've, ta we've talked about this, but at least in terms of the very, very, very beginning of this supply chain of violent extremists, it may be that the public health model that says here are Here's the vulnerable community. Here are the conditions that produce the threat. Here is the best way that we know of to reduce it. And so it's actually going to reduce the number of people that go to the next stage. So I do think, in addition to trying to gather the kind of information that we don't have that Graham's analogy speaks to, we may also want to try other models. We've got 15 or 20 minutes. We've got a bunch of good ideas around the table. I am sure of it. These guys will also have some responses to it. So I want to go back to the kind of the discipline that we had at the beginning. If people want to intervene and offer up an idea and they could keep it to 30 seconds or a minute so we can get some back and forth, that would be the best way, the kind of lightning round of big conclusions. Who wants to go first? All right, I'm going to, is, is, there, a, is there a microphone someplace? All right, I'm, we're going to take the, I'm going to take one of the first comments here from the audience, but it's got to be 30 seconds. The, micro, the floor will give way beneath you at the end of 30 seconds. You'll disappear. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Akbar Khwaja, former World Bank official. Uh, and thank you, USIP, for organizing this peace game. Uh, I believe that um, peace effort in the world will not be complete unless there is peace in religions. And the peace in religion will not be complete unless there is dialogue. And dialogue is not complete unless there is knowledge. So I personally believe that sharing knowledge and learning about other religions is very important. I think consortium of rabbis, imams, the pastors, somebody mentioned, is a good useful tool. And as President Obama mentioned, religion is not radical. These are the people who are radical. So Al-Qaeda and Daesh, they are terrorists. Islam is not terrorists. Thank you. Thank you. Specific suggestions for policy actions, Farah. So um, I, I just wanted to echo uh, a couple of themes that had come forward and, and push back a little bit about uh, on the panel. Um, I think for many people, CVE is sort of the, the latest and newest and greatest thing that everybody's talking about because we have this great threat with ISIS um, on, on the table right now. But in fact, we've had 13 and a half years worth of discussion within communities that are on the ground to understand the ideological threat. And there's a lot of value in what we have learned. So I, I would say that while, um, while we haven't talked about it in, in the mainstream the way we are doing in the summer of 2015, um, believe you me, uh, there are people who from, from September 12th all the way since our country was attacked have developed the kind of understanding around why it is that people get sick. So what is my point? Um, when you asked for a very specific policy recommendation, I think one of the biggest failures has been, um, and we are here in Washington, is the partisan sh nature of this actual beast. Because the, the teams that are looking at this have not indeed looked back at what had happened and what we've learned to build off of it. And we spent a lot of time in the first part of this administration waiting and watching and thinking that things were different as opposed to moving the ball down the field. So policy recommendation as we transition into a new administration. And I am a bipartisan person. I'm simply suggesting as a former policymaker that we indeed take the lessons from policymakers in terms of what has been seeded, what we have understood, what the indicators are on the ground at the very local level, and the money, the hundreds of thousands of dollars, indeed millions of dollars, that our government has spent 
spend on developing programs on the, on the ground and scaling them up so you're not building on a new front. And then I have one other point that I did not raise today, but I will raise because it's provocative and people are going to throw tomatoes at me. Um, we does, talked anybody, does anybody have tomatoes? They might. I think you're okay. Um, we talked about the ecosystem in which some of this stuff thrives, and the the, par the, the chapters have been you know 9/11 onward, but actually the ecosystem has been building for 25 or 30 years in terms of the the mindset uh, on the ground. What specifically am I speaking about? Um, there was some reference down at that side of the table to uh, Gulf ideologies that are spreading in a wide variety of ways. So here's the policy question I have um, to to the panel, do you think our country will ever get to a place where we are able to reconfigure and reimagine what it would be like to speak openly and clearly about the impact of Gulf ideologies around the world, both in, in, in textbooks that are being sent to children to learn, um, in hatred that is being learned to spread, and in mosques that are being built. The diversity of Islam is one of the most important central pieces to building a new generation of young Muslims that understand how to push back. And when we allow one monolith to control everything, we are building that ecosystem. So that's my question for the, for the panel. You go, go ahead, Greg. Uh, um, I don't mean to duck, but I think I will keep my job for the time being. That is a very difficult conversation for us to have. And in some sense, uh, while we should be able to have it, it's more important that people in the region actually have it, because they're the people who can do something about it. And as I said earlier, our, anything we did, particularly as a government, is so suspect that even if we said something true, it probably wouldn't have much effect. Well, you have, you have tenure, right? So, so, so you can I say outrageous things every day, of yeah. course. But, Farrah, what, what outrageous thing would you have us say? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not in government anymore. And when I was in government, I was very limited in terms of how I could speak about Saudi Arabia, for example. Right. So what I will say is, in, in the demolishing of local cultures and heritage around the world. Um, we have seen and we do have evidence that Saudi Arabia has been responsible for doing that around the world. We don't talk about it. That makes a difference to how a young person grows up because when the only thing that they see is the newest version of what it means to be Muslim, it means that that young kid who has 800 years of history behind him or her doesn't look at that as important. So what would I want the United States government to do? I want us to be clear with Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Gulf that are promoting a monolithic kind of Islam and decimating historic heritages and diversity of Islam first. Secondly, we need to, we need to absolutely be clear about where foreign uh, books and textbooks are being written and published that are spreading a particular kind of ideology. We aren't speaking about that publicly. Okay. And I think that that's very dangerous. I, I'm not cutting you off for the substance, but just for the, for the, for the time. Do you want to say anything else on that? Or was... oh, I, I agree. It... So, so, so see, no, to, no tomatoes here. I'll come to you in one second. No, no, go, go ahead, but brief, briefly. We really in minute in, increments. I will do here. my best to make it in a minute. Thank you, David. And Farah, finally, you, you nailed it on the point that we know where the source of this ideology is from and it's spread. But beyond that, I want to be more constructive and just give my final statement in terms of a vision for the new Middle East. As I mentioned, what drives Daesh is, a pos is the ability to give these disillusioned youth a vision of what the future looks like. It gives them dignity, gives them respect. It brings back Islam in the forefront of what it was, the Khalifat, the heyday, the golden age of Islam. So we need to redefine that, but also provide it. So what I'd, I would like to just make, I do my best in one minute. You've just, I, you've just used your minute. 29 seconds, oh, okay, I was 29 right, right. seconds. I'll go to my final 30. So the vision for a new Middle East, addressing the legitimate demands, socioeconomic and political aspirations of young, educated and connected population, bringing dignity, opportunity and future to those populace. What is our goal in a regional perspective, stability and security in the region, political settlement for multiple military theaters, a proactive inter-religious dialogue to shift Islamic thought to the center from the far right. Iran as a Shia leader and Saudi Arabia as the Sunni leader should play a major part in this inter-religious dialogue. 
We require institution building and weaving conflict resolution, mediation, peace building into our academia, into our institutions and our governance. Reallocation of resources, GCC, stop spending money on buying weapons, instead pump it into more, you know, um, socio-economic development in the region and within your own populace and countries. We need regional cooperation, disaster management, humanitarian aid, economic opportunities, early warning systems and preventive measures and confidence building measures because there's no trust among these regional countries. And finally, in terms of the activities that the international community can do, this is when first and foremost, U.S. and the Western powers have to acknowledge their failures in their foreign policy in the Middle East. That's important. That's a first that they should do. Number two, they have to reorient their foreign policy towards away from these kingdoms and uh, monarchies and dictatorships towards more the, the aspirations of the populations. You know, you advocate democracy, but you play a different policy in the Middle East. Okay, I've got to cut finally, you. I've, I've got finally, to, I've, look, you've, you've literally just, what you've done here is covered every single point about every single problem in the region. No, no it's, it's, it's Which, important to, because I uh, tell you why, because this is the region that is burning and I want to just finally just okay. give you what, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, 30 seconds and then I'm going to unplug the microphone. No problem. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the British, the French and the Germans massacred each other two times in two world wars. Holy Fall mackerel, no, we're no, going no, backwards in time no, here. No, 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 because I'm trying to give you, the Daesh problem today is a snapshot in the history of of what we're looking at. In the future, you know, EU would never have been envisioned following the Second World War or the First World War. We need to think outside the box. Do not be in the mud of today. Think of what will be the bud and the future that will be created in the region of the Middle East. And that requires visionary thinking. That requires to understand that this is just a snapshot and to get out of it, we need to provide this new vision. And that's what I'm hoping that we can collectively do in the near future. Thank you. Andrea. Yes. <laughs> Andrea Koppel with the Global Humanitarian and Development Organization, Mercy Corps. We're working in most of these fragile states. Um, so my policy recommendation would be to change the framing. Instead of calling it countering violent extremism, we need to frame it as preventing violent extremism. It sends a very different message. It sends a message both internationally but also to Congress. It's going to take a lot of uh, hard work by this administration and by experts to educate Congress that the money doesn't need to go simply to F-15s, but it needs to go into the conflict mitigation programming, into the reconciliation, into addressing the root causes of what drives these youth predominantly into these extremist groups. Thank you very much. Um, We've only got five minutes here. Okay, so I'll try to be quick. Um, and by five minutes, it's not I mean, five no, minutes. I mean five minutes. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, there's, there were a lot of inshallah ideas there, uh, but they were good by Imad. Um, I, was, think, I believe that was very well intentioned. It's the inshallah and it did list. Cover, yeah, yeah, no, it covered a lot of ground. I just, we, because of time, I wanted to so, stop. I think, you know, uh, first of all, there's a lot of capacity constraints for people in this room. We, are, we propose things, we want to be the masters of it, but as always, it's, you know, who actually has the power to do any of this. So creating jobs for all the youth in the Middle East, well, you had an Arab Spring, awakening, uprising, etc., and everybody in the room, me, you, all the governments failed miserably, nothing succeeded, nobody created any jobs, it's still the number one issue in the Middle East, private sector wasn't there, and now there's not even any attention to that. So I think we really have to take a sober look at ourselves. Now, one of the big things we keep talking about in all the peace games, uh, it's the issue that keeps recurring, and we say we can't change that and it ends up being a defining component of the context, and that's the situation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And we take it for a given that Saudi Arabia and Iran cannot reconcile, cannot be working together, etc. I would posit that the circumstances are such in the Middle East, across the board, locally, nationally, regionally, that they cannot be fundamentally changed today, and that relates very significantly to this problem of the extremism problem that's being fueled, there are things that can be done and we heard great examples, but fundamentally cannot be changed unless there is a broader reconciliation or a detente between Saudi Arabia and Iran where they can act in some type of concert. And it's unrealistic as that sounds. 
I think the U.S. fundamentally underestimates and the policy community underestimates its ability to convene those two actors in a room and talk with them. And I think it's high time that happens, and I don't think we should doubt that it's possible. It very much is possible, and we should be working towards that. And I think that's a very tangible, even though it's ethereal, objective for okay. us. Okay. Tangible, but ethereal. Um, but look, I mean, it, it, c clearly your critical point which is, if you take things as they are on the ground right now, you could give up. Or you could say, what is it in this that will take us to some place we've never been before? And I think that point is a very constructive point, because frankly, otherwise you just get, you know, you would throw up your hands and walk away. So, for briefly. Yeah, I just wanted to actually pick up on the World War II piece, which was very interesting. Um, you know, World War II obviously had the, the largest, this is now the largest displacement in the world since World War II. Um, what arose out of World War II was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A lot of the Arab Spring was obviously, it was, it was an assertion of, of my rights. You know, I have, the, I have rights and that, that's how it started, a lot of it. Um, so I would just want to, us to see this as a rights-based, whatever happens, it should be rights-based. It should be human rights-based. It shouldn't be uh, based on generalizations about an entire community of people between the ages of you know, 16 and 30. Um, I think we need to be much more specific than that. I think we need to respect that there are differences in all communities, including, of course, the Muslim community around the world, uh, and that people are vulnerable for different reasons, but that whatever approach is taken, it should start locally, and it should be, be rights-based. Thank you very much. Jocelyn, very briefly. Very short. I think that the idea would be talking about vision. Is the more we have been discussing, we are still in a Cold War vision with the center state, uh, the state being the major actor and looking for a superpower that in this current situation would be the US. And I think it doesn't reflect what are the din dynamic at the ground, which is people who distrust politics, people who want to be empowered uh, on a daily basis. So what does this mean? It means that we have to f give up the idea that the U.S. can solve and should solve the, the question of violent extremism. It has to be a multilateral approach, including also the Muslim countries. And not only looking at Muslim states, but independent thinking outside the Muslim states. That's why when I hear all the time Iran versus Saudi Arabia, I'm not sure that it reflects the, the capacity of innovation that exists in different civil societies and that can be um, tapped into, but not through the state channel. We have to forget about the state, not to forget about it completely, but not to bank on the state only to resolve these kind of global issues. Thank you very much. I want to turn back to you guys. Based on what you've heard, do you have anything else you would like to add to this conversation? I just want to pick up the uh, inshallah agenda, which seemed to be exactly right, <clears throat> and, a, and a wonderful vision. Uh, but I guess as I look back over the last 15 years, if we've taken a snapshot of how we thought about the terrorism problem at three-year intervals, it would have been quite different one from the other. Uh, and we know that uh, uh, ISIL will go away at some point, but it'll morph into something else. Uh, we tend to get focused on the flavor of the month. And I think the underlying conversation is the one you're trying to have about how do we think about causes is hard, how do we think about key points of intervention. Uh, it is, it's going to be a long task because the kinds of demographics, economics, sectarian, identity politics that are going on in the Middle East are all going in the wrong direction. So it isn't going to go away quickly, and that I think makes the, the, the task of trying to see if we can understand it better, get beyond our putrid air diagnosis of the problem, all the more important. Uh, it's very hard, I think, but it's also very necessary. Where it seems to me in a funny way, as several people have said, really at the beginning of thinking about this problem after we've been working on it for 15 years. I mean, it's sort of the uh, typical American <clears throat> ready, fire, aim approach, and uh, it seems to me this is a time for stepping back and trying to say, yes, we know there's going to be continuing manifestations of this violent extremism. Uh, can we 
move back a step and really have some sense that there are things that we, but more important, others might do to do something about it. Graham? So if I stay with the theme here, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, uh, we will look back on this after a decade or two and still be amazed how different our views are then than they are now in the way that one sees in the public health or medical analogy. And uh, in the public health space, if we take Ebola, there we have a good, good idea. What the cause, what's the transmission, what's the fix, and look at what's happened, okay? So it's pretty amazing. If we look at yellow fever, actually there's no yellow fever in developed countries now, but 30,000 people died from yellow fever last year, just not in the countries that we think about most of the time. So it has not been eradicated, but if we want to take influenza and flu, every year there comes flu. Remember in 1918, 50 million people died from flu in this huge influenza epidemic, more than in World War I. So I suspect a, a posture of humility about what we're doing and exploration is the place where I take away. Yes, I think humility does play a huge role in this and, and I think it's essential even as we need to embrace visions that are, are bolder than that. And I think the humility takes many forms, uh, one form of which is to recognize this is not of this moment, something a lot of people have been working on for a long time in the U.S., but of course it's something that people in the region have been working on for centuries in many cases. There are issues that have existed for centuries that we need to recognize as having historical roots, but there are also phenomena which are new, that we have to recognize are different and where old solutions will not apply and where we need to be creative and understand what's new about them. And that also requires a degree of humility. In a purely practical sense, we also have humility about peace game. We can't bring together a group of people, even a brilliant group of people like you, for a day or day and a half and solve the most intractable problems in the world. Um, I'm reminded a little bit of a story that was told last night by one of my colleagues, Claire Casey, who I think is no longer here, but who has been very helpful in, in putting this program together, uh, and I'll return to that thought in a moment. But she described growing up as the daughter of a foreign service officer in Cairo, and during the day, uh, some local workers would come periodically to the house and grab the mango tree and shake the mango tree, and a few ripe mangoes would fall out of the tree which they would then pick up and eat those mangoes. And that's kind of what we do at the Peace Game, is we get a bunch of people together and we shake the tree a little bit, and hopefully a few ripe mangoes fall out of the tree that can be useful in shaping the policy discussion and moving it forward. We don't have the aspiration uh, that we are going to solve the problems that have been insoluble. We are just gonna move closer. Fortunately for us, this is an ongoing process, again, thanks to the support that we've had from our sponsors at the UAE Embassy, but, but the cooperation between USIP and foreign policy and all of you, and this is a growing process. You know, we started out with one a year uh, in Washington and in Abu Dhabi. This year we're adding a discussion in September, uh, the beginning of September, which is gonna be in Brussels. Uh, our, our, we'll then have our Abu Dhabi meeting, Abu Dhabi meeting in the, I think, what did we say, the 9th and 10th of, of, of December. Um, and we will have a number of outreach meetings uh, with government leaders here to try to bring these messages forward. We have at Foreign Policy the Peace Channel, where articles appear based on this, and the preparatory uh, articles you know, that lead up to these meetings, the concluding articles that we draw, and we encourage all of you, if you have ideas on these things, to send the articles to us, and we'll post them on the Peace Channel. We have six million people who read different parts of foreign policy each month, and so it's a great platform to get those ideas out there so the dialogue also continues via that platform, and we'll look for other platforms as we go. So from my perspective, this has been extremely worthwhile discussion. 
because there have been a, a, quite a number of, of ripe mangoes that have fallen from the tree. Um, and before I turn it over to Nancy, I do want to say in conclusion, a special thanks to the wonderful people at USIP who've made this fantastic setting and this fantastic meeting possible, to my wonderful team from Foreign Policy, um, um, uh, Grace Rooney and Stephanie and the others who are back there, Maria, who have made this possible. Um, it takes a lot of work and you don't see all the work. We use the model of the duck gliding on the surface while it's paddling furiously beneath the surface. A lot of work has gone into it. And so before I hand it over to Nancy, I, I just ask you to all join me in thanking the USIP and FP staffs who put this together. Uh, Nancy is our, is our host, and so I will turn to her for the concluding comments. Great. Thank you, David, and thank you for your energetic uh, emceeing through the day and, and uh, moving us all through a very complicated dialogue. Um, I think that Graham's historical frame bringing us back several hundred years was helpful. Uh, thank you for bringing that at the end of the day, Graham. And uh, thank you also, Greg, for bringing in the framing that I think underscores some of the difficulty with our own internal politics here in the United States, both of which are very helpful. Um, and if we remember back to last night when um, Tom Donilon talked about a region that has um, really lost its state structures in at least four countries at this point, and also at the beginning of uh, the Arab Spring, there was an effort by the Obama administration to do, as it was termed in the Cairo speech, align our interest with our values. And I raised that apropos of the Inshallah agenda and how it then quickly ran aground as the inability to um, balance the disintegration and insecurity with an effort to hold that frame. And it seems that if we think about the historical framing on this, and a number of you talked about the long time frame versus short actions that we need to have. That's an important thing to walk out of, um, of holding all of those multiple um, uh, dimensions in focus at the same time. Uh, the second really important uh, point that I wanted to hit is, is that um, from a policy perspective, it is how to balance the hard and the soft, and that was raised in a number of, of ways uh, last night and, and today. And being able to have a better evidence basis on our public health uh, set of questions, we need that so that we can bring that to the table to balance the hard and soft, to rebalance some of the budgetary considerations and understand the interrelationships. So I thank all of you for the very lively, uh, both in role and out of role, uh, uh, approaches that you brought to the conversation today. It was, it was a long day, as people really stayed with it, and um, I think surfaced a lot of good ideas, and as David indicated, we will seek to bring those forward in mango form or otherwise um, to fruition, um, thank you, uh, to, and, and to bring to bear on further conversations together and on the policy conversation as we look at the challenges ahead. I want to echo the thanks to both the foreign policy and the USIP team, especially to those who worked through the night. Uh, Lisa, Jamie, Jocelyn, and masterful leadership with George Lopez and Bill Taylor. Um, working with Grace and the, and the foreign policy team. Thank you, very, thank you very much and thank you for being here with us today.